This is the San Ysidro Port of Entry. It's the largest official border crossing on the U.S.-Mexico border and one of the largest land border crossings in the world. That is an encampment of about 30 to 40 Russians who have fled Russia since the war in Ukraine started. Most of them are anti-Putin, anti-war protesters who are afraid of the repression that Putin has unchained against dissident voices. As getting out of Russia got harder, the fastest way to the U.S. without a visa was to fly to Mexico, then cross the border on foot. But U.S. border guards turned them away. And this is their life now. Until something happens. Irina, a schoolteacher, left Moscow with her family after she was arrested at an anti-war protest. You know, the decision was was made very fast, just in a few hours. Uh, and we started to understand that the borders are, 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 are locking and the opportunities to escape from Russia are reducing. So we took the first tickets that we could find. What, what made it necessary and urgent for you to get out as quickly as you could? We cannot make changes. We tried for many years. We, we were trying to do something. We wrote about it. We went to demonstrations, so protests all we could do without breaking law. People with such thoughts that are opposite to the government, to Putin, uh, uh, are now cannot feel safe now in Russia. Under American law, any person can claim asylum at the border. So why would the U.S. reject Russian dissidents? The answer is Title 42 an emergency public health order that allows authorities to expel or turn away asylum seekers with no due process. The policy started under Donald Trump, supposedly in response to the pandemic. But it was really the final blow in a larger effort to shut down the border to asylum seekers. Estamos aquí por para protestar contra el título 42 que afecta más a nosotros los haitianos, los molenos que los demás. Porque ya tenemos más de 20.000 haitianos que fueron regresaron en Haití a, a pesar de todo lo que está pasando en nuestro país. Title 42 has no real basis in public health. It applies only to asylum seekers, while every day tens of thousands of people with U.S. passports or visas cross the border with no regard for COVID. The Biden administration now says it'll get rid of Title 42, but not until late May. In the meantime, people like this woman and her children, fleeing cartel violence in southern Mexico, are turned away by U.S. border authorities, then escorted from the checkpoint by Mexican police. Those turned away usually wind up in migrant shelters, which, all over Tijuana, are overflowing. There's about 500 people living here right now. Most of them are from Mexico, Central America, a number of Haitians. These are people who have been at the border trying to get into the United States to seek asylum for months, in some cases years, and have been rejected because of Title 42. They've been here for so long, and it's been happening in such large numbers, that they've essentially settled in to live here indefinitely. Me iban a matar, yo tuve que venir, me dejaron botado todo, me quitaron mi casa, me quitaron todo. No tengo nada, nada, absolutamente nada. Las maras. Las maras. Porque tal vez uno tiene sus hijos y quieren que, que ellos quieren reclutar a los hijos como soldados a ellos. Y entonces yo no lo acepté. Yo no lo acepté. Para ellos, nosotros no. No hablemos nada, pues así como andamos. ¿Cuánto tiempo lleva acá en Tijuana? Me cinco meses. Y cuando usted llega acá a la frontera, a Tijuana, y indaga para cómo llegar al otro lado, sí, ¿qué no, le dicen? ¿De qué se enteran? Nosotros fuimos allá a la, a la garita y en la garita nos dijeron que nosotros teníamos que voltearlo para acá atrás, hacer un papeleo. No nos dan ninguna respuesta aquí. ¿Usted está enterado de, de la guerra en Ucrania, la sí. guerra entre Rusia y Ucrania? Sí. Claro. Bueno, en, en las últimas semanas han llegado refugiados de esa guerra y se han presentado en la garita tal como lo hizo usted. 
sino que a ellos los han estado dejando entrar a Estados Unidos. Pero para no, que, otros para no que los dejan de entrar. Lo, yo pero, quiero preguntarle qué opina usted de eso. Pues yo doy gracias a Dios por una parte que dejen de entrar a la gente porque esa gente está sufriendo, es una guerra. Han matado a toda su familia, el que podió huir huyó, pero también se habían de condolerte de nosotros porque nosotros tenemos problemas serios. When the US implemented Title 42, the intention was to keep out migrants from the global south, not Russian dissidents. But the Russians felt the effects of the policy all the same. As their encampment grew, Mexican authorities tried to persuade them to move to hotels or shelters. The Russians are extremely reluctant to do that because they think, or they have been hoping at least, that at any moment the US might decide to let them in. Among the most reluctant to leave the encampment was Anna, a theater director from Moscow. Did you expect that the United States would turn you away? Конечно, мы не думали, что окажемся в такой ситуации, и дальше с того момента, как меня не пропустили, стало ясно, что я остаюсь, остаюсь в лагере, остаюсь со всеми остальными, потому что это наш единственный путь и это наш единственный шанс. То есть мы мы сейчас не представляем свой статус, мы не знаем, кто мы, какие у нас есть права, скорее всего, никаких прав у нас Нет, но мы понимаем, что, что скорее всего, если мы, если мы уйдем из лагеря, нам грозит либо депортация, либо мексиканская тюрьма. But things changed on the seventh day of the encampment. The U.S. consulate in Tijuana, along with Mexican authorities, offered the Russians a deal. That deal is that if they pack up and leave, Tomorrow morning at five in the morning, they'll put them on a bus that crosses the border into the United States. The Russians have agreed to this. A lot of them are extremely suspicious. They're afraid that this deal is a lie, but they're also exhausted. I would be absolutely unsurprised if it turns out that they just used this as a way to manipulate them into leaving the camp. But we'll see. Maybe it's true. The refugees were told to keep this deal secret from the press. But they told us anyway and shared their location, a hotel not far from the border. So it looks like this might actually be real. We have a bunch of Mexican immigration vans outside loading up their luggage. All the Russians are downstairs. It definitely looks like they're picking them up and taking them somewhere. We're just going to try and follow them to see where that actually is. So we followed the vans right up until we couldn't anymore and are still in touch with the Russians. And they were brought here, which is a border crossing known as El Chaparral, which is closed to the public. It's effectively a sort of back door away from the public eye. That's really remarkable. I have never heard of anything like that happening in years of covering immigration and border policy. The deal was so strange and opaque that not all the Russians felt they could trust it. Anna split from the group and stayed behind in Tijuana, afraid that the promise to cross the border was a ruse. The day, personally for me, the emotional pressure reached a crisis point. I couldn't handle it. And at night, it was made a decision to leave from there. Потому что мне сказали, что вполне вероятно, как только мы ушли с места нашей дислокации, нас всех теперь скопом могут депортировать или посадить в мексиканскую тюрьму. If there had been a clear policy, instead of this shady, dark agreement, do you think that you would be in the situation that you're in now? Кто из нас? не мог даже предположить, когда приезжал сюда, с чем он столкнется. То есть, конечно, мы рассчитывали в первую очередь на правосудие, да на здравомыслие, в конце концов. Никто не знал, что мы столкнемся вот с такими бюрократическими или, я не знаю, как их назвать, сложностями. С тех пор, как началась война, я все время собираюсь, куда-то бегу. Я, я приехала сюда, потому что мне было страшно там. И здесь мне абсолютно так же страшно. 
In the days after the Russians made it across the border, refugees from Ukraine started arriving in Tijuana by the thousands. Although it was never official policy, the U.S. made a blanket exception to Title 42 for Ukrainians. But it only allows in a few dozen at a time, creating a backlog of hundreds. Volunteers from the U.S. flocked to the Mexico side to help. And the city of Tijuana let them use a bus station near the checkpoint. We developed this process that we, we do staging, where we house people until they're ready to go. We have a, a second facility that was given to us. It's a like, sports facility that is uh, 2.3 kilometers from here. So, and, and it's a it's a beautiful facility, but it's only 300 people and they're full. Our location here, the border, is dedicated to the people who are ready to go to the border within the next uh, five hours. When U.S. border authorities are ready to receive them, refugees head to the checkpoint to cross in the order that they arrived. Okay, how many adults, how many kids? How many family units? The whole system comes down to a handwritten list that volunteers keep on yellow legal paths. Alieska and her daughter were in Tijuana for three days before their turn was called. I left Ukraine in the third day uh, of the war and, and going in train to Poland. It was about two days we waited in the, that train. It was uh, too difficult. Everyone just cried. We didn't have even water. Then I stayed in Poland. When you leave Ukraine, you understand that you live and you don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you don't know when you will back. And you don't know. I leave my dog. It was difficult. Okay. <laughs> Mom, daughter, grandson. When it rejects migrants from other countries, the U.S. often says it's because it has no capacity to process them at the border. But the arrival of refugees from Ukraine and Russia revealed that the U.S. can make room for certain asylum seekers when it wants to. For now, Ukrainians are the only ones being allowed in publicly. As for the Russians who were allowed to cross secretly, most were detained for about five days, tested for COVID, then released into the U.S. That included Irina, the school teacher, who went straight to the San Diego airport to catch a flight to Houston. But Irina's 18-year-old daughter was separated from the family to be processed as an adult. I think that Olga is still there just because the detention is full. I think that's the problem. The vast majority of people have to wait on the other side and are still waiting on the other side. And how does that make you feel, knowing that and, and being on this side now? Every person has its own story. And uh, I, I don't know if it's, uh, it was the luck. Having been through what you've been through, do you think that U.S. border policy right now makes sense? Is it a system that you uh, no. <laughs> that, that, is, that is reasonable or understandable? So from my side, it's like a Russian roulette. When you come to the border, it's unknown, it's completely unknown, by which principle the officer at the border is allowed to pass the car or not allowed to pass the car, by which principle people отпускают сразу, отпускают через несколько дней из бордера, да, или тоже совершенно кто-то говорит неделю, кто-то месяц, кто-то провел три месяца, то есть где какие-то правила, где какая-то логика, совершенно, совершенно непонятно. What's next for you? What happens now? Uh, now we are now we are going to Houston uh, to rent a, an apartment or, or to just to start a new life. It's a bit frightening, you know, and I'm going to build my life here. 
Of course, they will be growing up here. Of course, I understand that they will not speak Russian uh, so good, but they will speak English.